Welcome to the last video of my beginning TDD series. In the previous videos, you saw how we gradually started the TDD cycle, extended the functionality of our list of T implementation by writing tests, letting them fail and making them green afterwards. You learned why you can trust your tests as well as the different forms they can come in. For example, triangulation, behavior verification or structural inspection tests. We also had a look at the builder pattern as well as test doubles. In this video, I want to discuss more general aspects of testing. I'll start with the following question. Do I have to strongly stick to the red green refactor commit phases when I'm doing TDD? I would answer this question with a clear no you don't. Just have a look at the previous videos. Most of the time I wrote a failing test, implemented the corresponding functionality to make it pass and afterwards committed my changes. When I was actually refactoring stuff, I did this in a new iteration that ended with another commit. For example, when I introduced the list builder class. Sometimes I even went back from the green phase to the red phase because I realized that my test wasn't specific enough. I then transformed it so that the devil's advocate had to provide the correct implementation. In my opinion, the whole red-green refactor cycle is just a visualization of these three tasks. Write a failing test that shows something is missing in your production code. Transform your production code to make the new test pass and all the other ones you've written before too. Change your code so that it is more readable but does the same thing. You should accomplish all these three tasks when writing software, but you can go through the TDD phases as you like, with one exception, you should always write a failing test first. How often should I commit? As often as possible. If you have a look at the history of my repository, then you will see that I committed every 5 to 10 minutes most of the time. This usually leads to smaller commits and better traceability because you can easily read through all the steps that were taken to implement a certain functionality. Also, you can easily go back to the latest commit if you screwed up the current iteration and you'll most likely just lose 10 minutes of working time. Interestingly enough, I sometimes found it hard to commit often, especially when I implemented something in a top-bottom fashion. That is, I write a test for an orchestrating clause that uses other objects to fulfill it and I have to create the classes for those other objects too before I perform the commit. But this scenario leads us right to the next question. Can I commit a failing test to the repository? Yes, you can. And this makes sense in the case I just described. When you write an orchestrating class and all other classes that the former uses, you might start off with a test against the orchestrating class. It will fail, but you actually need some or all of the other classes assembled to let it pass. Commit this failing test. Then you can write tests for the referencing classes and complete them. Now go back and inject the correct object to the orchestrating class so that the original test passes. You maybe shouldn't commit a failing test to the master or dev branch. But you can really do this on a feature branch to remind you that you haven't completed the orchestration functionality yet. And that's why you should use a proper distributed version control system like Git for this task. And the final question for this video is, is there anything that I shouldn't test? The short answer for this one is no, you should test every aspect of your code. The more sophisticated answer is that you will probably have a hard time writing automated tests for all your code, especially for the one that exists at the boundary of a process. This can be the user interface, data access or something related to networking. Also, multi-threaded code is often hard to test. The idea is that you keep the code that is fiddling directly at the boundary of your application as small as possible and test it manually. All the other code that usually connects with these boundary classes via composition can be verified with automatic tests. And there's the option to use test doubles for those boundary objects in these cases, so that you, for example, do not call a web service in your tests, but stop the corresponding dependency. So it is actually your design decision if you write an automated test or test manually. 
If you have to decide, keep the following points about automated tests in mind. The main benefit of them is the rapid feedback they provide. After a click, in some seconds, you know if your code is working. And that is all parts of it, not just the one you're currently working on. As a direct result, you gain more confidence in your code. You are sure that it is working because you let it execute successfully a lot of times. Nonetheless, your tests might get ugly because of the following reasons. You have to set up a lot of objects, especially mocks and spies, to actually test your functionality. Again, prefer triangulation over behavior verification to avoid setting up a lot of test doubles. Use the builder pattern or another appropriate one to encapsulate the creation of test objects. If this does not work in your current case, you maybe should consider manual testing to avoid brittle tests with a large arrange phase. Tests that depend on random numbers, time or multi-threading are inherently hard to test as well as code that interacts with other systems at the process boundary. Consider stubbing those objects for your tests, keep them humble and check if it wouldn't make more sense to test this boundary code manually. And that's it for this video. Of course, I have to give shout outs to a lot of guys and companies that enabled me to produce these videos. Thanks to Pluricide.com, an online video training platform that assembles world-class developers, IT pros and designers. Viewing the screen of a really good developer while he's writing and explaining code is a tremendous benefit. And also thanks to the following really good developers that I learned so much from. Mark Seaman, Robert C. Martin, aka Uncle Bob, Martin Fowler, Kent Beck, Scott Allen, Steve Smith, and many, many more. But these are the ones that really taught me how to do proper TDD and automated testing. They all share their ideas in their books, blogs, and videos, which is really amazing. A special thank you goes out to Gérard Mesaro for his book X Unit Test Patterns, and to Steve Freeman and Ned Price for their book Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests. You should really get hold of these books if you want to get good in writing automated tests. Thanks to Brad Wilson and all the contributors of the xunit.net project. Your framework is awesome. The same goes out to Linus Torvalds, Junio Hamano and all Git contributors for this amazing version control system. And finally, thanks to Microsoft for the Windows 10 technical preview and the Visual Studio 2015 CTP that I can use for free in these videos. As you see, I stand on the shoulder of giants that did a lot of thinking and work before me, and you can find links to all of them in the descriptions of this video. Again, thank you so much for watching this series, and I hope to see you again in the next video. Bye!